Okay. My name is Don Feld and I retired from the Air Force in 1994 as a full colonel. How did you wind up involved in the military? How did you get into the military, Don? Well, I went to Iowa State University and I was in their ROTC program at Iowa State. And my father had flown B-17s in World War II and I, I guess I wanted to follow my father's footsteps. I wanted to fly in the Air Force. Of course, he flew in the Army Air Force, but... It was a little bit of a different Air Force. That, that <laughs> Just, was Army Air Corps, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, Army then? Air Corps, yeah. Wow. So it was a little bit different, but he, he flew out of uh, England, uh, B-17s over Germany, of course, and, and had, a, had a successful tour because he returned. A lot of guys did. That was a tough, tough tour. Yeah, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, they lost a lot of people. In fact, I, I think they actually lost more people, you know, in those bombers than they did on the ground. I, I mm -hmm. read that one time. 25 missions was a long way to go in those planes with a lot of opposition. Yeah. So you went into the Air Force, mm -hmm. and can you lead me through where uh, where did you go? Uh, I I rate? went um, I went from college uh, straight to pilot training at Vance Air Force Base in Enid, Oklahoma. Okay. And out of Vance, my assignment was actually to an A thirty seven, and when I got to uh, survival training. Uh, I was sitting in the blue room, as we called it there, in survival training. They were giving us some briefings, and some a gentleman got up on the stage and uh, called out my name and two of my buddies' names and said, uh, your assignments have been changed from A-37s to A-1s. And the three of us looked at each other and said, what's an A-1? You know, <laughs> so we go back to the queue and we hunt and we find a, a little a small picture of of an A1 and we all said oh no it's just a little bitty prop airplane what you know we were going to be you know jet jockeys fighter pilots you know and now we're just going to fly this little prop airplane of course you know when we got to Hurlburt for our training there and walked up to the Sky Raider it's like oh my god this thing is so huge how am I can't possibly fly this thing. <laughs> so it was quite a shock. For people that don't know the size of the Sky Raider, I think the prop alone is what, 16 feet? Um, is it 14, 16? I think it's 12 feet across. It's, 12, it's just but, massive. But, you know, it's it even at 12 foot across, you know, I mean, the bottom of it hits me about in the chest, so... Yeah, the engine, am I correct that it came off, the engines were off like B-29s or something like that? Um, yeah, they were used on the B-29. They were our right uh, 3350s, 2700 horsepower. Okay, just monster 19, engines. Yeah, 18 cylinders, two rows of nine. Yeah, it was the biggest um, prop or engine ever put in a prop-driven fighter. So... Um, Let's transition a little bit and go forward. How did you wind up in Southeast Asia? Or where did you wind up in Southeast Asia? I'm sorry. <laughs> well, um, of course, we went through uh, uh, flight training in the Sky Raider at Hurlburt Field in Florida. And then uh, we left here and we flew to the Philippines. Um, it all of the... the class of mine. I was in a class of about, let's see, 12 of us, I think. Um, we went to the Philippines and went through survival training. And then we went to, uh, I went to Thailand. In fact, we all went to Thailand to Nakam Phanam Royal Thai Air Force Base in Thailand. And that's, we flew out of, I flew out of that base my, um, whole time there. Uh, I arrived there at the first part of 1970 and left in the first part of 71. And uh, I, I did on a couple occasions um, 
fly out of other bases in South Vietnam and in uh, in Thailand, other bases in Thailand. I sat alert, Sandy alert at other bases. So, um, as you come in to the squadron, you probably weren't qualified Sandy yet. You had to no. earn, learn a little time on some missions and some trips and work your way up. Yeah, I, I may be been a bit crazy because I said I wanted to fly at night. <laughs> So they put me in the Zorro Squadron, in the 22nd uh, Special Operations Squadron. Uh, those are the Zorros, and their mission was primarily to um, fly night missions and destroy trucks on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And so basically the first part of my uh, flying there out of Thailand was flying every night um, out on the trail and uh, destroying trucks. And we would fly for 90 days and get three days off. Three days off? Yeah. 90 for three. <laughs> yeah, 90 for Uncle three. Uncle Sam was rubbing that penny thin, <laughs> wasn't he? He's getting every yeah. cent out of you. And, uh, and we pretty much, especially those of us that flew at night, pretty much flew every night. Um, what made you choose? And I find this interesting when I ask this question of guys that said, I want to fly nights. What drew you to that? Well, that's a good question. I guess um, I just enjoyed the quiet and solitude at night, I guess, you know. Um, and, and there's a certain beauty at night, I think, in, in flying at night. Uh, and it's a challenge, you know. It is a big challenge, yeah. especially in the A-1. <laughs> yeah, especially. Yeah, it's, it, again, a World War II aircraft, but not a lot of navigation in it. Yeah, that, that airplane was actually, I think it flew its first flight on, on the day I was born. Really? I, I found that out when I was over there, and I found that quite ironic. That Happy here, birthday to me. Yeah, I hear I'm flying an airplane that's as old as I am, so. Holy cow. So... Let's let's progress up through night flying. Um, you enjoyed. Uh, I, I assume that you did very well on that. And how did you get into becoming a Sandy lead then? Because those seem like different roles. Yeah. Like daytime, nighttime. Well, of course, I, I say you know nighttime. I mean, I flew a lot of night missions, but I did fly some day missions. Um, we all did occasionally, you know, fly day missions and. Uh, I don't know, you know, at some stage I became, um, you know, a lead. Um, so I was leading my own flights. And uh, then you kind of work your way up a ladder, I guess, you know, and eventually then they made me a Sandy pilot. And I uh, got to set for, we didn't actually at NKP, we didn't actually, or we didn't normally set Sandy alert. But we did get sent to other bases like Ubon to set Sandy Alert. Um, and Sandy Alert, just for the folks watching, to clarify that, you sat in case anybody was shot down to correct. launch and do the search and rescue, and you would start the process, correct? Correct. All right. And um, uh, so I think over um, at Da Nang, the fellows that went over there to OLAA, they sat alert a lot over there. Um, but at NKP, we actually at NKP, we normally had um, a flight of Sandys that orbited um, in northern Laos and a flight of Sandys that orbited in southern Laos. And they were just doing exactly that, just orbiting in case somebody got shot down and then they'd respond to that. Uh, but then occasionally we also would have uh, a, a sandy uh, flight that would uh, set alert at, at Ubon, which is south of NKP. Basically just strategically placing yourself yes. for emergencies. Yeah. Uh, 1970 things were heating up a bit, to say the least, with the, with the aerial war. Yeah. And the, we started pulling out at that point. We were downsizing our troops. Was it 70 or 71? Mid-70s, mid um, yeah, they 
they began giving our airplanes to the Vietnamese. Uh, so we thinned out a little bit. In fact, during my tour there, I started out in the 22nd in the Zorros, and the Zorros closed, I think, in June or July. And then I transitioned over to the 602nd uh, Special Operations Squadron, and that closed out, I think, sometime in October or November. And then I ended up in the Hobo Squadron, or the, the first. So I, I managed to hit all of the squadrons that were there at, um, at NKP. I'm telling you, you're, uh, if you had a t-shirt made, it'd look like a deck of cards with the, with all the monitors. Well, yeah, with all the patches, yeah. That would be, yeah, your, your party suit must be just covered. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh... So, yeah. um, let's talk about what it, what it took on a search and rescue mission to be a Sandy Lead, and can you talk about a mission that, that stands out in your mind? Yeah, um, I guess my first, uh, mission that I was, uh, Sandy low lead on. Um, I was actually in the southern orbit and I had a friend Fred Kishler and he was leading a flight in the northern orbit and they had a uh, an F-4 go down uh, and the, the pilot and backseater jumped out and uh, they were kind of on the side of a of a of a hill, karst, uh, and then there was a main road that ran east-west down below them, and uh, so uh, because of the call that went out for you know rescue, I headed north, and I'm headed north to the scene, and Fred had uh, pinpointed the the two uh, pilots on the ground, and he was heading south. <laughs> because he'd been shot up and he said you know you got it basically we, he handed it off to me he had been the, the low lead and he was handing it off to me as the low lead and I arrived on the scene and uh, was briefed by a forward air controller about you know what was going on and uh, then uh, the fact unfortunately uh, he was running out of gas, so he had to leave, so then I was all by myself. Um, and uh, the area was was hot. There was, they were lobbing, it was along this road, this little heavily defended road, and they were lobbing shells into that area. In fact, at one point, my wingman said I disappeared in a cloud of flak and he thought I was a goner and then he said I came out the other side and he was like wow you, you know you're still you're still uh, flying but um, of course any Sandy mission your first job is to locate the survivor and pinpoint their, his location so basically we had the survivors uh, locations and they were right near one another and we had their positions uh, located um, and there was a Jolly Green uh, orbiting in the area ready to move in. But the second task of, uh, of a Sandy, once they've located the survivor, is to, you know, basically neutralize the, the, the threat. And there was quite a bit of threat there. Um, one of those threats was a, a quad gun that kept firing and I I uh, probably, against the, the normal rules at that time, I took the gun on and and uh, managed to silence that gun. And uh, then we we attempted the first. Uh, there was a kind of a valley that led from the south up to the road, and um, I briefed the helicopter pilot that if we went down that valley. And, and across the road he could go right up to the, the survivors and pick them up. So it seemed relatively you know, easy to do. Uh, so we, we attempted that first attempt and we escorted the helicopter and he got uh, towards the end of that valley and near the road and he started taking ground fire. And he, uh, he just popped straight up there was an overcast at the time. He popped straight up through the clouds, and uh, so okay. So I said, "Well, 
okay, I, we need to do something about the, the road. And uh, uh, the fact had, or the crown that was controlling, had advised me that there's a flight of F-4s with napalm if I needed them. <clears throat> so I called up this flight of F-4s and described the target to them and told them they're going to have to come down below the clouds and I wanted them to lay the napalm down the road, you know, to try to neutralize the, the, the uh, firing that was coming from that area. And the uh, F-4s came down and delivered that napalm exactly where I wanted it. And in fact, it was so close to the survivors that it splashed up the side of the hill and actually was very close to the, the survivors, the napalm. <laughs> actually, later, I, I also flew U-2s. And later I was at a, a reunion for U-2s and I was talking about F-4 drivers and complaining about how they couldn't hit their ass with both hands. That's, you know, maybe that's not the right thing to say, but... And one of them was an F-4 driver and he said, well, I don't know about that. He says, uh, and I was uh, describing this, this mission and he looks at me kind of funny and he says, that was me. <laughs> was he the guy on the hill? Or was he the guy no, he flying? was the guy flying that oh, dropped really? the napalm. Yeah, he says, that was me. And I go, wow, well, you really did a good job. He says, well, thank you. At any rate, so, so, the, uh, so the first one had failed. We put the napalm in, and we, we tried a, a second go at it. And basically had kind of the same result on the second one, only the problem was we were getting fire from the east. And so I said, okay. Um, I also knew that I had a flight of A1s with smoke, and they were called a smoke flight. And basically, they just carried canisters of white phosphorus smoke, and they could lay a barrier of smoke. <clears throat> and so I said, okay. I briefed them where I wanted the barrier of smoke laid, which was all along the right side of this valley, so that we could fly down and be uh, screened off from the guns on the right and you know and get to the survivors and so we we tried that attempt and uh, put the smoke screen in and again we bring the jolly in the same result only this time they took a small arms round through actually hit one of the PJs in the in his watch believe it or not, um, but uh, they, they, they didn't get to the survivors. Unfortunately, you know, in those days, we did not have the capability to do a night rescue. And so it was getting dark and there was no way for us to try uh, another time. And that was one of the saddest moments of my career there. Um, I called the survivors on the ground and I told them, I said, you know, we, we've got we've to quit for the day. I said, uh, you're going to have to sit tight for the night. Um, hopefully they don't, you know, find you. And I said, you can talk to Crown uh, throughout the night. Um, if you have any problems there, they're listening for you. And, uh, and I headed home. And... Uh, I got back to the base and got out of the airplane. I was walking back and I was going to head to to uh, debrief the, the mission. And my crew chief said, sir, you got to come back here and see this. And he took me back to the tail of the airplane and the tail of the airplane was full of holes. So obviously the gun that I had taken care of uh, almost took care of me. But um, I went in and I debriefed and we did some planning and decided that the best thing to do was to get around the other side and come up over this kind of mountain that was there, come up over the mountain and down on that side and get them, you know, rather than trying to come in this direction. So the next morning they mounted an early morning uh, uh, Sandy mission and they picked the two guys up the next morning and apparently didn't have 
hardly any problem doing it. So that's fantastic. It yeah, turned out good because when you said it was your saddest, I was like, oh no, oh no. Yeah, no, no, they they got both of them. Did you ever get to meet any of the other gentlemen? No, or I talk didn't. To them? No, and the funny thing is. And I, I don't know, I sometimes wonder, you know, if I was in a fog the whole time I was over there. But uh, I don't remember, you know, most of those missions we give them a name like, you know, um, Tiger 2-2 or something like that, you know. Um, the call sign of the plane that went down. And frankly, I, I don't even know the call sign of the plane that went down. I can't remember it. Mm. Um, and I've always thought I need to look that up sometime. Um, my... Second rescue I was involved in um, involved another friend. Um, should I mention his name? I don't know if I sure. should. Yeah, uh, his name is Doug Carmichael, and this time, Doug the two. Yeah, this time I was in the northern orbit and Doug was in the southern orbit, and we got a call that there was an A7 driver and. Uh, that was um, heading out of North Vietnam and heading for NKP and, and he was having problems, you know. Uh, I don't know if he was just having mechanical problems or if he'd been, uh, you know, uh, hit by ground fire. But so I'm going south with my wingman and Doug's coming north with his wingman and uh, we're looking for, and we're listening on the radio to this um, this A7 driver, and the A7 driver finally tells his wingman, he says, "Well, he says, I, I think this is it. I think I think the engine, had, you know, well, yeah, the engine's quit. I'm getting out." And we both said we thought we could hear the whoosh as he as he departed the airplane, and uh, so we're looking for him because we knew we we're right in the area. And all of a sudden, I hear Doug says. I got him. I got. I got the survivor. He's coming down in a chute. And I thought, okay. Uh, and about that time, <laughs> that A7 goes right across my nose like this, and right into a rice paddy, and just explodes in the rice paddy. <laughs> I said, well, I've got the airplane. <laughs> and uh, so, <sighs> this was another one of those times when it was right at dusk. It's just going to get dark. And Doug and I both knew that the Jolly Green would never make it there because it had to come from Yubon. And so uh, Doug says, I'll stick with the survivor. I'll orbit him. Um, he said, you go see if you can get the helicopter from the base, from NKP, because it, it wasn't that far. It might have been all oh, 10, 15 miles or so across the river so so I went and contacted the base and they launched the helicopter and I said yeah we've got a you know down pilot and we need him to pick him up okay so they launched a the helicopter and and he says so uh, which way and I said just just head straight east okay and the, the helicopter driver starts to approach the river the Mekong and he says uh, is he on a, on the other side of the Mekong <laughs> which is bad guy territory. And I said, yeah. And he said, oh, I can't go there. He says, I'm just a base helicopter. I can't, I can't go across the river. I said, look, if you don't get across the river and pick this guy up, I said, you know, it's going to get dark and we're not going to pick him up. And, and you know, he, he could be, get picked up by the bad guys. <laughs> and he said, no, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, shouldn't, I don't think I can go over there. I said, look, we have four sandy you know aircraft here to protect you and i said we haven't taken any ground fire and the guy you know it, we know where he's at he's on the ground it'll be easy pickup just pop his you know flare and you can pick him up i don't know I said look if you don't cross the river i said i'm gonna shoot you down <laughs> and the guy says well okay i'll go well he went and picked him up and brought him back to to uh, NKP so we got that guy the third one I was involved in was the rescue of uh, uh, some people in a helicopter that had gone down right near the Ho Chi Minh Trail and uh, on this particular one 
um, we we managed to you know pinpoint him and pick him up um, and but uh, we weren't sure that that we'd gotten everybody you know that was in the helicopter there's a lot of confusion there about how many people were on the helicopter and and how many people we'd picked up and so forth and prior to the actually the pickup um, I had called Crown and I knew that there was going to be an arc light which is a B-52 bombing run that was going to be right in that area and I had called Crown and I had told him you know can you you need to cancel that arc light because they says we got survivors here on the ground and you know <laughs> we don't want to drop a load from a B-52 on their heads and they said yeah no problem we can we can do that so we're you know this confusion and so forth about whether there's more survivors on the ground or not so I'm basically circling the area uh, and calling on the radio and trying to see if anybody else you know comes up on the radio on their uh, survival radio and of course I'm not getting any responses but I'm just gonna make sure I'm just and so I'm circling and all of a sudden I see something you know out of the corner of my eye and I roll up and here comes the arc light all these bombs exploding down the side of me <laughs> so I pulled turned and flew out of the area and uh, got on the radio to crown and I may have gotten a little excited in uh, telling them you know what a mistake they had made <laughs> in, in almost killing me how close do you think that arc light was to you? Oh, it probably was a mile away, I guess. Yeah. You know, that's not far enough. Yeah, that's not far enough. No, it's yeah, not. Yeah, that's, that's some rate. massive destruction yeah. that's raining right. down. It is. Yeah, it's scary to see. Anyway, rate, so that was the third one. Uh, Evidently, nobody was still in the helicopter? Apparently not. They'd gotten them all. Okay, but like I good. said, there was just confusion about how many people were there and how many we'd actually picked up. But uh, apparently we got them all. Uh, my fourth, fourth and final rescue took place in November. Um, I can tell you the day. November 13th. Or 15th, I think it was. Tailwind? Yeah. They were there. I think they so, hit the ground on the 13th and we... We got him out on the 15th, I think, is the thing. I, I could be wrong about those were days. I four days and three nights on the ground. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends on which, yeah. Um, so, I I go down um, to the Tuac Tactical Unit Operations Center at NKP, and, um, and they brief me on this mission I'm going to be sent on. And... I'm briefed on a new munition that I had never dropped before, uh, and it was called, um, I don't remember the actual designation, but it was CS gas, which is powdered um, tear gas. Um, and they briefed me on the situation. The situation was that there were approximately 120 troops on the ground um, in southern Laos, and uh, they were in contact with North Vietnamese troops and, um, and they were going to be overwhelmed, uh, you know, shortly if we didn't um, get there and help them to, to help them get rescued. Uh, the issue was that they were in contact with the bad guys and uh, they had a clearing and a place for rescue helicopters to land they needed to break from these from the bad guys in order to get to the helicopters and so the scheme basically was for us to drop this this tear gas essentially on the bad guys and of course some of it's going to end up on the good guys but that would allow them to you know disengage with the bad guys and get to the helicopters so that they could get rescued and get out of there so that was the general plan. Um, there was a flight scheduled ahead of me to do this, and unfortunately they had to return for some reason. I don't remember what it was. They had some mechanical problems. 
and then there was supposed to be a flight behind me. Uh, so I took off and with my wingman, uh, at this time I'm a first lieutenant and my wingman was Major Art Bishop who had basically just gotten there. And uh, so I think he, he thought kind of, you know, what am I doing on some lieutenant's wing, you know, okay. <laughs> but, but he he felt that I probably had more experience than him, so. Um, That's what this, it came down to at that point in time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Who had the experience, right. not the rank necessarily. Correct. Yeah. There were some times that the rank over... You know, not, with, with, not, right. nor, not in the A1 normally. I mean, we pretty much wanted the most experienced person to lead okay. the flight. Um, so this munition... Um, Bluey 32? Yeah, I think that was the designation. It was canisters that um, mounted in this, it was a very large um, munition. It was a big square thing that hung under the wing. And these canisters were supposed to fire out the bottom of it. And then they would burst open and then spread this powder. Well, to get it to work properly, you had to fly 50 feet above the trees and hold the pickle button down for about 30 seconds in order for all of the canisters to fire out. And you needed to be at 50 feet above the trees because you wanted the canisters to fall down through the trees, the canopy, the jungle canopy, and then burst below the trees. If you dropped it above them, it's just going to land on the trees and it won't get to whoever's down below. So. They also briefed us that this was a, a hot area. There was lots of, you know, ground fire and everything in that area. Um, so my wingman, Art and I, we arrived in the area and um, I made contact with the forward air controller. And uh, this was an overcast. It was completely overcast. So I spiraled down below the overcast and and met up with the forward air controller and left Art above the clouds. And uh, he briefed me uh, on, you know, this pointed out the line that I needed to fly um, right down this contact line where the troops are in contact. And he said he wanted me to, you know, deliver my first um, load right down that line and then come back and go straight across it. And so, I went up and briefed Art and told him just to follow me down and trail and what we were going to do. And so we spiraled down under the clouds and, and uh, you know, I flew down this line and held the pickle button down and looked for ground fire and made it to the end, pulled up, climbed back up through the clouds and Art followed me and then we spiraled back down and we made the cross pattern. And then the two of us climbed up through the clouds and we sat up there and orbited over top of them and I listened to the, the uh, FM radio, um, which is what the, the uh, troops on the ground, they were talking on the FM radio. And I could hear them gagging and choking and spitting and, you know, they were having a terrible time. Um, but Despite that, they were able to separate from the bad guys and they were headed for the helicopters. Um, so we're waiting up above and the FAC actually asked us to wait because he knew we had other ordnance on board um, and that, uh, you know, he might have to use that other ordnance. So it, the whole story of Tailwind is written in a really good book by, I think it's Barry Pensick. Yes. Um, Operation Tailwind. Yeah, Operation Tailwind is the name of this mission, basically. And it was a Special Forces mission. There were 16 Special Forces troops and 120 or 104 mountain yards. 120 total. And they'd been on the ground, um, I think, three days or four days and three nights, something like that. And, yeah. and they had done some tremendous work. Um, and it's all described um, in Barry's book. 
Um, but on, on being rescued, um, one of their helicopters, the last helicopter, um, that they barely got on it. I mean, the bad guys were running, almost running up the ramp behind them. Um, but they got airborne and they lost one engine and then they lost the second engine and they had to um, land it and they landed it in a, on a sandbar in a river nearby. They had a spare helicopter though and they picked the spare helicopter picked them all up. Every one of those uh, 16 Special Forces guys had at least at least one sometimes two or three wounds for these days that they were on the ground. Um, and there was a little medic um, that had kept them all alive throughout this whole mission um, and uh, that medic eventually got the Medal of Honor for his work. Uh, Gary Mike Rose. Gary Mike Rose. The other um, reason that they were so uh, entrenched with the Vietnamese Vietnamese would, would normally break after the A1s got there, but this group had seized, had, they had overrun a camp, and they mm -hmm. had, it was the largest haul of intel in the yeah. entire war. And when they said the number of pounds, I, I, I just looked around and said, that's like three filing cabinets. Right. And it was code books and maps, and yeah. it was a tremendous coup, but yeah. the, the Vietnamese did not want them leaving the area with that. Right. They had encountered uh, an actual, actual headquarters for the transportation group that um, brought uh, supplies out of North Vietnam down to South Vietnam, down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And, yeah, so it was, it was a big coup on our part or on their part. But obviously, like you say, it... Uh, it warranted a ma maximum effort from the enemy, from the North Vietnamese, to stop them. Uh, so they were they were in a lot of danger. So at any rate, so I'm orbiting up there, and unfortunately my engine is starting to run kind of rough, and I'm pushing the prop up, and it, which helped keep it <laughs> running a little smoother. But the forward air controller asked if we would come down and destroy the helicopter that was there on the sandbar. And I told him, I said, no. I said, I don't have enough gas to get back to NKP. I'm going to have to go to Da Nang. And besides, I said, I think my engine's, you know, running rough. So we went to Da Nang and uh, on downwind, uh, <laughs> The controller was trying to get me to go out on a 15-mile final behind a bunch of F-4s, and I told him, I can't do that. So I went to tower frequency, declared emergency, and and turned turn final, and there's F-4s breaking out everywhere. And I landed and taxied into the arming area and rolled the canopy back, and my engine is going bang, bang. It sounded like 20 mic mic going off. So it probably was only a few seconds away from destroying itself but uh, but I got on the ground safe and took him several days to repair the airplane and I flew it back to NKP so was it ground fire or what just um, I don't I don't really know I, I I I just think the engine just you know destroyed had itself had enough whatever so at any rate uh, that was my last rescue and uh, I left then sometime around the first of the year to come back to the States. What so, did you do after you returned home? Uh, after I returned home, I came back and I was a T-38 IP at the base that I'd learned to fly at, Advanced Air Force Base. And uh, from there I went to, to get a master's degree in engineering uh, at the University of Florida. From there I went to wright Pat and I was lead software engineer on the F-16 program. And from there, a couple of old friends, Fred Kishler, the guy I talked about, had been flying U-2s, and he uh, convinced me to come out to Beale Air Force Base and interview for the U-2 program, which I did. And How did you find that flying? Was that very satisfying, the U-2? Oh, incredibly satisfying, yeah. I mean... In the first place, you know, 
um, we're basically in in uh, peacetime, but it's the Cold War, and you know when when all the other guys are uh, you know practicing bombing and whatever, um, the guys flying U twos were actually out doing you know a, a mission, an important mission, and so it was uh, it was very satisfying to be out there doing that during the Cold War period. Most of that's still classified, isn't it? Yeah, a lot of it's classified, but the the interesting thing is that uh, you know the U two is still flying twenty four hours a day, seven days a week, it's somewhere in the world, and it's still you know a primary um, reconnaissance platform supporting um, other countries as well as uh, our troops. It is quite an aircraft, and uh, I mean, if you take just in comparison. The A1 was built, and you're flying it on your, you know, probably twenty-something birthday. That U2, it is the same lineage. I mean, that thing, it's like the B52. It's right. going to retire the Starship Enterprise. It's yeah. just, yeah. Yeah, it uh, was developed in 1955 by Kelly Johnson. Um, you know, at Skunk Works. At, at the Skunk Works, and uh, you know, he was a tremendous aircraft designer and did such a great job of designing the U-2. And of course, it's probably most famous for the shoot down of Gary Powers. But also, I like to think that it was also very famous for what it discovered, uh, like during the Cuban crisis. Mm -hmm. And I like to think that, you know, it's continued to contribute um, tremendously, like in, in the wars that we've had since then. And in fact, uh, there were uh, U-2s that were flown in Vietnam, uh, and so some of my friends, uh, my older friends, uh, flew them in Vietnam. Now they were, uh, I believe they were based out of Utapau, weren't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, we were talking earlier, and I, I believe I mentioned his name, Roger Youngblood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Roger is another guy that got me involved with this, and he sent me 180 reels of 8 millimeter film that he shot when he was over there. And it was everything from, you know, uh, C-123s, tons of A-1 stuff. And then there's these two reels, and I see a U-2 taking off, and I see a U-2 landing. And I called him up, and I said, Roger, dude, where did you get this stuff? I said, this is like me walking into Area 51 right now and coming out with video of aliens. I said, do you know how top secret this was at the time? And he goes, I was into stuff. But the thought that a a film was taken, it was sent to Kodak Labs, developed, and then wound up sent to his house in Texas and it sat under in a closet for 50 years. I'm thinking to myself, what else was, you know, came through security by accident, <laughs> you know? But, yeah. Yeah, no, they did. They flew out of Utapau during, uh, during the Vietnam conflict. But, I mean, they've been flying basically ever since they were developed uh, in the mid-50s. And uh, up till today, and they're still flying. It's not the same airplane, of course. Um, the older airplane, the C model that Gary Powers flew, was a smaller airplane. Um, they, the next airplane was called a U-2R, and, and it was uh, about 40% bigger. And then they, they did another manufacturing run in the 80s and those are the airplanes that are flying today and uh, then they've been updated with new engines and new avionics and um, new actually somebody once said the the only thing old about them anymore is the basic airframe and the skin everything else on the inside is brand new yep. but uh, you know they're they're doing an important mission even to this day. So Don, what, if I had to ask you to pick, what was your favorite mission to fly in which aircraft? Hard call there. Yeah. I guess I, I, I really have to admit that, of course, one of the things that I tell people is, is the funny thing about this is both airplanes were tail draggers which is kind of unusual in an Air Force, you know, like ours, uh, especially to have a tail dragger jet 
uh, which the A1 or the U2 is. And of course, the A1 was a prop driven tail dragger. Yeah. Um, so I have a lot of tail dragger time, you know, in the Air Force. Um, but I have to admit that uh, I, I did enjoy flying the U2. And I think it was primarily because it's, it's sitting in that seat, you know, above 70,000 feet looking down on the world. Um, and I've always enjoyed flying all by myself and uh, tried to do that both in the A1 and in, and, uh, and in the U2, you know, I was always by myself. Did that of your night flying by any chance, the solitude? Exactly, I think it probably did, you know. I just, I enjoyed being by myself and I enjoyed um, the solitude and so forth and the, I guess just the joy of, of uh, being up there, you know, way up high. Um, I think in the, of course I look back and I think, that, gosh, I was just a 20-something, you know, flying this huge machine, the A1, and dropping every kind of ordinance that we probably had available at the time, um, and flying some really interesting missions, uh, the rescue missions in particular. Um, I don't, the rest of them that we flew, I think, were just sort of standard attack missions. Uh, the rescue missions I thought felt were the important thing uh, when we're out saving other guys uh, on the ground. It's interesting, I, I had a tour in RAF Staff College. Um, it's a year-long course, an exchange officer with the RAF. And I discovered that the RAF doesn't believe in rescuing their pilots. And this was a shock to me. I couldn't believe it. So you have to give a and a presentation to the whole class during the course and my presentation to the whole class during the course was about the A1 and our mission of rescuing pilots, you know, down pilots. And for the Brits that they had a hard time understanding that I guess or they still maintained that there was no need really to rescue pilots so but I just never could understand that. It, somebody just today said they thought that was, you know, a World War II kind of um, uh, mindset of, of the Brits. Which... They've been like that a long time. If you look at the British Empire and how they actually waged war, it was queen and country, and if you made it back, great. Yeah. You know, yeah. whether it was in the Navy or whatever, and uh, or, or in their imperialism period. Yeah. I was just thinking about that, and, and you're right, the World War II was the same thing. You know, they lost a lot of guys in the British Channel, yeah. you know? Yeah, we, uh, I, I'm proud of that, especially proud of the A1, you know, and the fact that we go get ours, and we bring them back. We at least, we will try, try to our utmost, to our very best, to bring them back, and we did. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Don? Uh, no, unless you got any more questions. I think uh, ending it with "and we did" is a great place to stop. That that uh, it was very. Uh, oh, I guess I can put a plug in. Sure. We just recently dedicated uh, an A1H model at the Air Force Museum in Dayton, Ohio, and. Uh, there's a whole um, section of the museum that is dedicated to the rescue mission to the Sandys and, uh, and this particular airplane which was involved in one of those missions. And uh, it, uh, I think it's a great place to go if you want to dive into search and rescue and see, you know, the real thing, the real airplane and, and uh, the real mission and what, what it did. It's a good place to go to see that. Were That's, you there at the first unveiling or the second? Base? I was there at the first one. Okay. Yeah, the unveiling of the aircraft. Uh, that was a very special time. Yeah. Um, I did not get to go to that one. I was uh, I was on another shoot somewhere, but um, I went to the second one, and um, they had a lot of the PJs and and facts, and I mean it was this huge. Everybody that was involved in rescues, and. Um, 
I got chatting with the PJs. They're very interesting people. They are, that's a unique breed of a human being. <laughs> they are very brave, very yes. brave. And what is the hallmark of a PJ or a Jolly Green? Uh, the green footprints? Yeah. So I'm, I'm photographing and I come around the corner, I've been talking to these guys and there's two of them just bowed up looking like Cheshire cats. And I was like, what's up fellas? And they split apart sideways. And I look, and they had put a pair of green footprints on the tail of that brand new airplane. I was like, you did not. <laughs> and they were like, yes, we did. They yes, did. we did. All right. It was the funniest thing. And I'm All like, right. they're going to kill you. Like, they're no. not going to kill us. No, I but don't think so. They, but they, they marked their territory to make sure that they were, you know, yeah. um, if you know the story behind the PJs and, and the Jolly Greens with those footprints, everywhere they went, they yeah, yeah, that became their signature. So yeah. I, I thought it was very appropriate. You know, that bird may never had a uh, footprint on it, but it sure did when they got done. So yeah. Well, Don, thank you so much. One. Yeah.